Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Uh, last year about this time, I was fortunate enough to be joined by Rosemary Gibson, author of this uh, very important book, China Rx, which uh, really gets into extraordinary detail with, with a great deal of good writing and, and, and it's very interesting, which exposes the, uh, the risk that America faces because of our dependence on China for our medicine. Uh, I think millions of Americans are taking prescriptions and they don't know it, and their doctors don't know it very often. How much? How many of the drugs they're taking are made in China, um, and some drugs we can't even make in the United States. We can't make aspirin, we can't make penicillin, and nor can we make uh, a lot of generic antibiotics. So, China's aims to become the pharmacy of the world, and uh, that poses a lot of risks. And and. Uh, Rosemary has uh, written effectively about those risks and has some ideas for solutions, and we're going to dig right into it. So, Rosemary, welcome. Bill, it's really great to be with you. Thank you so much for <laughs> a chance to, to have a great conversation on a really important <laughs> subject that affects us all. Yeah, great yeah. to see you again. Although well, last year we did it via Zoom in the beginning of the pandemic, mm -hmm. and everybody's trying to figure out Zoom. As I, re I recollect, we had these freeze frame moments where... Mm -hmm. I'd talk and the thing would stop and then yeah. we would go. So this, hopefully this is much better in person. <laughs> it really person. is. So uh, uh, let's begin at the beginning. When when did China start becoming important to our drug supply chain? Be it starts 20, 30, 40 years ago, doesn't it? That's right, Bill. It They started getting into the global market and our market in the 1990s, maybe a little bit in the late 80s. And... The China free tr trade deal that opened up free trade, reduced the barriers in 2000, that's when we saw the floodgates open. And China Rx chronicles that. And so one day I'm sitting in my home office and put the pieces together. It took three years to research China Rx because it was so hidden. So once we opened up free trade with China in 2000, that's when we lost our last aspirin plant. We can't make aspirin anymore. It's when we lost our last vitamin C plant. We can't make vitamin C. Our last penicillin plant, gone. Mm. So our trade policies have had a dramatic impact. And, China, and before that, China was doing something very smart. They were investing in infrastructure. And here we were in the 2000s and earlier just demolishing it. So it's really put us in a terrific disadvantage. Well, I'm afraid I'm guilty of that. I, w I was on Wall Street at the time and private equity in various uh, capacities. And I remember outsourcing was the rage and, and going for lowest cost production anywhere in the world you can find it without really much consideration besides the cost and ability to drive down your, your product price. Uh, Congress passed a law that, that authorized uh, manufacturing generics or they opened things up. When was that? That was uh, done during the Reagan administration. It okay. was the Hatch-Waxman, and it had tremendous right. bipartisan support. And so you're right, that was in the 80s, and that allowed millions of people here in the U.S. to have more affordable drugs. So you have the branded drugs, and then you have the generics. And that Hatch-Waxman bill started the generic in, uh, sector of the pharmaceutical industry. So, like a lot of things that we're now paying the price for, it started with good intentions. It started to drive the cost of drugs down. It started to, you know, we could manufacture elsewhere besides the United States. And then you fast forward to where we are today, and as a result of a lot of things we can talk about, China now dominates the manufacture of a lot of our critical drugs. And they had a cost advantage, and they drove the U.S. manufacturers out of business sometimes with, uh, with predatory practices. China did engage in illegal trade practices, and China Rx is the first to document the cartel. They form cartels, the vitamin C cartel, the penicillin cartel, and that's the playbook, just like steel. 
So this, a lot of people think, and I thought, I knew nothing about this subject, Bill, before I started working on this. Now, your background's in palliative care, and it's, you, you... It's in health care, and I was just looking to write a, uh, another book, and I stumbled on this subject. I'm not an expert in pharmaceuticals. I'm not an expert in... Yeah, but you're, in China, but, but, but you're more than that. You won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big yes. deal. Well, I've had the privilege of working at a healthcare foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey. It was started by the, one of the founders of Johnson & Johnson. When he died, he left a... There's a huge firewall between... We had nothing to do with the company. But uh, at the foundation, I, when Jack Kevorkian was out doing what he was doing with helping people end their lives, yeah, Dr. Death. Suicide, there was opportunity, and I was there at the foundation. I said, what can we do about this? Long story short, in uh, about 15 years, I had the privilege of leading a national effort to put palliative care in the nation's hospitals. When we started in the mid-'90s, there were maybe three hospitals that had something called palliative care. And now there's about 1,800, and it's brought great, uh, tremendous uh, benefit to patients and their families and to those who care for them because it's a more humane way. And it's how a lot of physicians and nurses, it's why they went into their professions, not just to do things to people, but to actually care for them. Yeah. Well, and so you brought that, that, that passion and that knowledge to, to this book, and you had to had lots of experience with different drugs and things like that as part of that process. And is it, what was the trigger that led to, down to the, the, the fact that we've now had this uh, terrific uh, expose, I, just, I would say? I was just looking to write something that was interesting and useful. Yeah. You know, in the health space, what's our purpose? It's the relief of suffering. And the palliative care work was emblematic of that. And this... Uh, We'll talk about the quality of our drugs going down and actually harming people. So this is along that same theme. But I just stumbled on this subject, Bill. I was uh, a friend of mine was testifying before the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission about supplements coming from China, the dietary supplements. And that got me curious, and I just started looking and looking. And what I began to find was, was shocking about how dependent we are on basic medicines that run the nation's hospitals, the brand name hospitals that everyone knows. Here we are in Washington, D.C., and it's whether you're Johns Hopkins or Georgetown or Washington Hospital Center, Nova Fairfax, George Washington, people go into those hospitals and they're betting their lives on that one or two cent generic pill. And they have no idea where it's coming from We'll talk more about how the FDA just doesn't have the capacity to ensure their safety. So if you look at the bottle of pills, unfortunately, I'm at the age of life where I have... Several, have a couple of those? I have, <laughs> I have more than a couple. I, after reading this, I looked on the label to see, well, where was this manufactured? And it doesn't really tell you. That's deliberate. They don't want us to know. Deliberate, they being the Chinese, they being the drug companies. The drug they... companies don't want us to know. Didn't I read somewhere, I think maybe you pointed out, that something like uh, only 6% of Americans trust drugs made in China? Yes, there was a poll conducted about 10, 12 years ago. And this is a t when people remembered dogs and cats dying from tainted pet food. Remember that? Mm. And the infant formula. So 96% of Americans don't trust medicines coming from China. So the industry, there was, there was legislation introduced about 2007, 2008, and it was killed right away. And I asked someone from the industry, why did that happen? And this person was very candid and said, well, they probably thought it was best if their customers didn't know where it w would be coming from. It would be bad for business. So it was killed by the, one of the, the big pharma companies. Absolutely. What is big pharma? I mean, how many companies are we talking about in the United States? There's Johnson and Johnson. There's Merck. There's how big? A, how big a? Who are the who are the culprits here? If we want to call them that. Well, there's <clears throat> big companies that are selling vaccines now. Uh, I think your viewers will know who they are. 
but it's a $500 billion business in the United States, drugs. I think what I didn't know, and most people don't know, is that there's big pharma, but they only account for 10% of the drugs that we take. Hmm. Most of the medicines we take are generics, and they've become commodities, and they're bought and sold like T-shirts. And the names of the makers of those companies are names you and I would not recognize. And they don't want us to know the names of those companies because you wouldn't be able to pronounce their names. And they will certainly never be called to testify before Congress because that would show where our medicines are coming from. So right now, 25% of our generic drugs are made in India. But one of the jaw-dropper discoveries in China Rx is that India depends on China for about 70% of the core ingredients for its generic industry. It cannot survive without China. And what are some examples of those core ingredients that China controls? Do they have unpronounceable names, or are there things that we would uh, well, recognize? The, oh, the biggest uh, and real concerning thing is antibiotics. Yeah. So here in the U.S., we used to have these giant fermentation, industrial-sized fermentation plants. And uh, I interviewed someone who grew up in uh, Connecticut and lived nearby one of these, and she could smell it in the morning when she would wake up. It was right along Long Island Sound. And she became a pharmacist, actually, in her <laughs> career. So I said, maybe there was some, something there in that, in that air you were breathing that led you to a, a great career in pharmacy. And so we you know, remember in World War II, right before Normandy, there was a government and Pfizer got together, and perhaps some other companies, to ensure there was enough of this miracle drug called penicillin. And that was so important to help injured soldiers survive from their injuries so they wouldn't succumb to infection. And they had that ready right before Normandy invasion. It was a great government industry partnership for good. Mm -hmm. But let's fast forward to 2004 when the last plant in Syracuse, New York, to make this active ingredient in this raw material announced it was closing. And for the reasons we talked, it closed exactly because China dumped it on the global market. And they kept that price low for several years. And even India lost its last penicillin plant. So you have a country with more than a billion people, and they can't make critical antibiotics along with us. Well, yours was a pretty lonely voice when you published this book three years ago because there were a lot of people, I think myself included, that was thinking of China in the old paradigm. We, you know, we had a China lobby. You know, Hank Paulson made his career at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Absolutely. You know, raising capital for Chinese companies and getting U.S. companies into China, and Goldman Sachs is still a big deal in China. They've made but, a lot of money in China. Oh, and still do. Um, but the, th the thinking was liberalized world order, world trade agreements, we bring China in, make them part of the, uh, the, the, the trading, uh, world trading economy, and there we'll become wealthier and uh, more liberal and maybe move towards a liberal democracy and we would welcome them into our... They'd be more like us, wouldn't that be More like good? us. Well, well, guess what? They didn't want to be... <laughs> they did not want to be more like us. And we now, I think particularly in the last year or two, Xi is really flexing his muscles and they're becoming... It's becoming increasingly clear that they've got these... Uh, uh, you know, they've been a bad actor. Now... Was this obvious to you early? I mean, what, when, did, when did people start waking up to the fact that China had an agenda that was not even remotely along the lines of what we would find acceptable? There were a small number of people who quietly picked this up but wouldn't speak out on it. But this, you're right, this coronavirus pandemic has helped a lot more people see the reality. So we were talking about antibiotics. We can't make antibiotics here anymore in the United States. It's, it's shocking. It's the, what you give to your 
children or grandchildren for ear infections or if you have pneumonia or bronchitis or if you have COVID. And what happened during the pandemic? Remember when Bill and China threatened to withhold antibiotics from the United States? I do remember that. I think uh, the, the, the Chinese government media um, threatened to withdraw drugs to the United States and throw us into the ocean of hell of coronavirus. China controls 90% of the key ingredients to make the essential drugs that the world needed to care for people who are hospitalized with coronavirus. So a pandemic starts in China, and then you control the supply of what everybody needs. Just imagine if the United States, along with industry, decided, well, we're going to control the antibiotic market for the world. And you drive out your, let's take India, you drive out India's capability by market manipulation. And then 20 years later, you threaten to withhold antibiotics from that country in the middle of a pandemic. Mm. We have to step back and say, what is this? This is a form of unrestricted warfare, unconventional warfare. It, it, it didn't just happen, though. It was orchestrated. Absolutely. And the point you make is that the Chinese Communist Party has subsidized many, many, many of what it considers strategic industries, pharmaceuticals being one of the key ones. And even in things like vitamin C, they wanted to get control of that market. And what they did was they subsidized their their manufacturers, and I don't know the name of vitamin C, it's a long one that I'm sure you can pronounce. Oh, ascorbic acid. There we go. Ascorbic yeah. acid. I yeah, can do yeah, that, that one. one. Okay, yeah. okay. I, I got think ascorbic acid. It's on the labels of a lot of cereal boxes and other okay, things. Okay, I, I can get that one. Um, <laughs> but, so with the, what the, the, well, the way this works, when you talk about people engaging, engaging these unfair practices, is they'll, they'll, they'll start selling at a cost lower than anybody else can, uh, can produce. And they'll grab the market through low cost, subsidized by the by the Chinese Communist right. Party, and then once they've driven everybody else out of business, then they can raise the prices. And they have effectively a monopoly price. How many drugs do you think they have that position? And you've mentioned aspirin, you've mentioned penicillin, you've mentioned a lot of the generics. What are some of the other key drugs that they've got that uh, that uh, monopoly? China controls the chemical materials to make thousands of our generic drugs and even brand name drugs. And they're moving up the value chain, and now they're making about 10% of the pills that we take. So they're making medicines for diabetes, Alzheimer's, uh, blood pressure medicine, antidepressants, HIV AIDS. Yeah, they make one of my blood pressure medicines. It was, uh, was yours recalled because of carcinogens? Do you remember that in 2018? Did you get a recall notice? No, I didn't. It must have been a different one. Well, there were millions of Americans still. <laughs> You're lucky. This, this, was, this is what happens. Rosemary, you're really scaring me to death here. <laughs> well, you, you know, uh, it's... it's <laughs> So I, mean, I was spent three years at my home You're office writing this. You're such a pleasant-looking person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, but I'm optimistic. This is fixable. Okay. So we'll get to All the right, point well, where we're going to get to the fixes. Okay, we're so, going to scare ourselves to death first. But you know what? And then... uh, that's what you need for people to wake up. Well, the thing that strikes is so there's so many stories here. One story is Smithfield Ham. Now, I, I live yeah. in Virginia, and the Chinese a few decade ago, twelve years ago, whatever, they bought Smithfield Ham, and I thought. Why on earth would the Chinese want to buy a company that makes ham? Well, and the farms. It, they bought the farms, too. And the farms right. th that raises the pigs. Right. And why would they want to do that? Well, it turns out, I'll let you tell the story. What is it about pigs that would be attractive to the uh, Chinese? Well, they like pork, and number one. And yeah, but that, that's not the sinister well, reason. Well, they have swine flu outbreaks yeah. and the shortage of pork. And I read a report. I did not have a chance to independently confirm it, but 
out on Twitter, they were saying that China's actually fl flying pigs. So pigs do fly. They're flying them over to China <laughs> from the U.S. Think about that. Well, it's well, very conceivable. And it, whether it's live or not, but they're flying pigs over. But from a medicine point of view, they control a core... Um, from pigs, you get the material to make a very important drug used in every hospital in the United States. And if you don't have that core ingredient, hospitals here would shut down. Well, I think you wrote that they make, from, from pig intestines, uh, they're sort of the raw, raw, raw earth equivalent in, in, in medical care. I mean, there are all these raw earth minerals that we use in all the other right. strategic industries. Right. And the intestines are the, are the rare earth uh, component for, for heparin. Yeah, I tried to, uh, this was in my testimony, I really appreciate you reminding me of that. I was trying to make the analogy, because people have heard about rare earths and how China has dominant global share of the production of that and processing. And it's the same thing with our drugs. They control those raw materials and chemicals. And when it comes to pigs, they have, they, you take it out of the intestines, the mucous membranes from the intestines that are processed into making a blood thinner that's used in operating rooms and in hospitals all over the country and the world. And 15 years ago, couple of years after it was outsourced to China from a plant in the Midwest. Hundreds of Americans died from contaminated heparin. China Rx starts with, this is real stuff here. China Rx starts out with a story of a Johns Hopkins trained physician. Yeah. He walks into the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. He's a healthy 40-something year old gentleman. He knew he had a stomach ulcer. Long story short, he ends up getting multiple doses of heparin. And he immediately goes into cardiac failure and is in multiple organ failure. His kidneys, just within hours. Well, he's a doctor. He's a physician. And you quote him as saying, you said if somebody was in his room, you said, my God, I got a lot of heparin. So think about that. And then the, he thought, yeah. it, was it contaminated? And it was. Think about this. You're a physician, and you're in a hospital bed, and you've just had this. You're in multiple organ failure. You've had to have your heart taken out and put on an artificial heart machine. And the next month, you're watching the news, and you hear about contaminated heparin found in St. Louis at a children's hospital. And he looks to his wife, and he says, oh, my God, I got a lot of heparin. Was it contaminated? And this story, it took, it's a miracle to find a story of what happens to people when there's a bad drug. Unfortunately, his wife is a physician, and she shared the story in great you know, detail. Well, your theme, of, one, of the theme, one of the big themes of the book is that China does this not by accident. This is not the result of entrepreneurial Chinese getting together to figure out how to take control of a of a market and end up mistakenly making contaminated drugs. It, it, it seems, as I talk with you about China and other people about other industries, and we'll just stick with pharmaceuticals, it seems like they, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they started thinking, what are the key things that we need to make here that are strategic, Absolutely. that will give us the whip hand over every other country in the world? I mean, I've come to believe that. Do you now think that there was a strategy sitting behind this uh, back in the 80s and 90s? Well, I think China was a very wise and strategic in wanting to build up, in this case, a, a pharmaceutical industry with their population of more than a billion people. Mm -hmm. You should have that. And this is just one of many other industries where they developed a plan and are executing it beautifully from their perspective to disrupt, dominate, and displace Western companies from those industries. And this is one of them. Because they have to employ, they have how many people they, they have to employ to give them some work to do to help people thrive, grow, move out of poverty. They're doing what's good for China. Well, yeah, there are two versions of the Chinese leadership. One is that they've absolutely have control and 
have this all planned out and the other one is they're terrified of their of their people and they've got to keep coming up with new things to keep them happy i mean they now have a a consumer market a middle class market of almost a half a billion people and here's where here in the us we own a large share of this problem it's not just the chinese who are manipulating the market, forming cartels, engaging in illegal trade practices. It's also on us and other Western companies. How so? So over the holidays, I found um, an old IBM ThinkPad in my closet. And it was, it was really old, but I turned, it, I turned it on, it still worked. I loved my ThinkPad. But of course, the software doesn't run on it, so it's no good. But the thing still worked. It was a machine. So I have a a new ThinkPad, but it's made by a Chinese company. So what happened in the course of those 12, 14 years? So I asked someone from IBM, a very senior person who's traveled to China and around the world, and he said, well, what we did was we gave away, basically, our, the specs to make our laptops in return for having access to China's market for our higher value products and services. The same approach was used by pharmaceutical companies. A major firm, a name everyone would know, gave away the specs for their generic drugs, antibiotics, and others in return for access to that market. They gave it away. Well, that's a trade that most uh, I'm just noticing a time here. You're watching The Bill Walton Show, and I'm here with Rosemary Gibson, who's written a terrific, uh, I'd say, expose of uh, the pharmaceuticals industry in China and its impact on the United States. And we're talking now about their, their strategies to uh, uh, gain control of these product markets. Uh, that strategy, though, is one that the Chinese have engaged in, not just with pharmaceuticals. Why well, you mentioned the ThinkPad, they most, most a lot of companies made the trade when they wanted to go into China. Chinese Absolutely. said, "Give us your technology, give us your intellectual property, in return, you get to sell into our country." And um, I think there are an awful lot of CEOs of big multinational companies that made that deal, made that trade, and. Um, I think we're coming to regret that kind of trade because it's now got us pulled into a situation where a lot of renovation has been either forcibly transferred to China or, uh, or stolen. And now it's escalating, whereby China has a social credit system for businesses, <laughs> not just individuals. So it was you, interesting. Well, explain? so <laughs> social credit for businesses. Okay. So uh, it was really. Uh, I have to laugh because it's, it's it, otherwise it's just too bleak. There was a, a Western uh, uh, pharmaceutical CEO, branded company, who I uh, is quoted in here. I didn't interview him, but I used a quote from the Financial Times. I think it was, and they bend over backwards to say, well. We, are, we will be a Chinese company. If you want to sell in China, you have to do what China wants you to do. They've got them over a barrel, and they can keep extracting concessions in terms of what they do. Sounds like what Jeff Immelt said when Obama became president. We're all Democrats now. There and you I, go. I wouldn't be surprised there if you he went to China and said the same thing to the Chinese. We're all Chinese now. Well, that's it. We're basically a Chinese company. So this is their, and what they've given away, billions and billions, as you said, of dollars in our intellectual property, research facilities. Well, we talked about contaminated uh, uh, medicine. Uh, there's a, there's a, it's not necessarily sinister. The problem is that the Chinese manufacturing facilities are generally of fairly low quality, and the health and safety standards really aren't there. And they're not really giving us access to the FDA, for example, to go in and inspect a, a manufacturing facility in China the way it would be inspected here. That's right. You know, I started out talking with you about how our medicines have become like T-shirts in terms of commodities, just buy and sell, and if it's 
a penny cheaper. The big buyers, which are three major U.S. companies, they just look for cheap, and they have algorithms to locate the cheapest price. But for these commodity products, its quality is a matter of life and death. And that seems to have been lost on a whole lot of people. You're absolutely right, Bill, that um, the quality concerns about what's coming out of China and other countries is very concerning. You know, you know what was sho another shocker in writing China RX? This, this outsourcing began in the 2000s. And the FDA was not in that country inspecting things. It didn't even know who was making our drugs. So we allow this to happen. And that's what happened with heparin. There was no inspection regime. And people died. So globalization has been just a f another form of de facto deregulation. And you can argue, well, maybe we are over-regulating in some sectors. But this is not a sector not here. that not... And, the, and you know what they do? I'm, yeah. a, I'm yeah. a deregulator, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe, not, maybe not here. Yeah. And what the FDA does is, this was the gold standard that the U.S. created. Of You go in and you inspect the manufacturing facility. So let's take right here in the U.S. If you're making a complex drug, it's called a, a sterile injectable that goes right into your bloodstream, it better be right, and it better be sterile. And the FDA will spend up to three weeks in that plant checking. And in China, it might be three days, if China will let you in. And plus, you have to give advance notice because you are coming in. The FDA is going into a foreign country. You have to get visas. And for a while, China was denying but, FDA visas. But you also make a point in your book that if you're an FDA inspector from the U.S., you're sent to China to inspect a plant, if you write a negative report, you're never going to get back into the country. So your career is done in China. So they've got a tremendous incentive to gloss over anything they see. Uh, there's an incentive for FDA inspectors, if they do their job correctly, which I think they're very dedicated at doing that. But think of what you're doing. You could stop the export of millions of dollars of product coming from that company to the United States. And do you want to be the one person? Well, yeah, that's the... And, and then you're right. Why would China want you back? And it's interesting, you hear the FDA say publicly that they have trouble f hiring people, finding people who want to go to some of these countries because it's FDA employees, many of them are unionized, and they have to volunteer for those positions. And now, look at with the State Department, you saw that uh, some of the diplomats going to China, they had COVID testing with anal swabs, and they did this to the Japanese. What federal government employee is going to want to ever go to China to do this important work on behalf of the American people? I've, you know, in this, this China RX book predicted a couple things that have come true, Bill. It predicted that in the event of a pandemic, the U.S. would be waiting in line with other countries to get vital medicines. That is exactly what happened during coronavirus. Examples? Um, um, some of the sedative products we couldn't get. Um, some antibiotics we couldn't get. You had 100 countries competing for the same medicines coming from a centralized source. We would never centralize all the energy supplies for the world in a single country or 80, 90 percent. We would never centralize 80 to 90 percent of the wheat or corn or other critical commodities for the world in a single country. It's just dumb. We wouldn't do it, but we've done it for these products because there's been no public interest perspective brought to bear on this subject. Well, the, the supply chain for this, for pharmaceuticals, drugs, generics, whatever, is incredibly complex, though. I mean, we've got 130, 40 countries making ingredients, Absolutely. assembling things like that. Is there anybody that, or any agency or any entity that has taken the trouble to understand that supply chain and where those dependencies uh, lie? This was a recommendation in China RX, and I'm very happy to say that both industry as well as the federal government are now being asked, so tell us your supply chain. 
Where does this come from? And they're being they asked by the FDA or they're oh, being... Uh, no, uh, Congress has asked the FDA to do it. Okay. And that's, I, I honestly... So this has that. happened in just the last year and since Absolutely. the publication of your book. Absolutely. Okay. And industry now is looking, which is surprising to me that even in industry, they yeah. have to make product that they did not, they knew they had suppliers, but they never asked their suppliers where their supplies came from and beyond and beyond. They didn't know. Yeah. But now they're asking. You know, um, a lot of people say, well, what does industry think of this China RX? And that was going to be my next question. Well, one of the, they're reading it. And uh, someone said, everybody's read it. Hmm. People in the FDA have read it. And one of the most, uh, I was, I've been invited by industry leaders to speak to them about these risks. I went to one meeting, and I'll just say that they all had to sign a, you know, a non-compete thing because you can't have antitrust. You know, mm -hmm. you have to follow you know, the antitrust laws. So they all signed their dis disclosures. We're not going to, you know, share what we're not supposed to share. And then I proceeded to tell the story of the vitamin C cartel, where <laughs> China formed cartels and conspire all that. I said, "This is what you're up against. You guys are dutifully following the law, but China doesn't care about you." and we let them get away with it. So the well, industry has, one, I've been hearing that companies are using China RX, they're bringing it to their board to have a discussion on it. And one of the positive things happening also because of what's happening in the South China Sea now, for risk mitigation, they are rethinking their supply chains. And they have thanked me for that. I was on a call two weeks ago with the CEO of a company and he said, thank you for this. You brought up something I just want to make sure people heard, which is the Chinese don't care about our law. And they don't care they, about the quality of what they send to us either. They care about what they sell to the Chinese people, but they don't care what they send to the is United that States. Right? They don't care. Do they have a different inspection standard for what they sell domestically versus what they export? Right, they don't care what they export. Look well, they happened. did that with the with the virus. I mean, in Wuhan, yeah. they had uh, all these airplanes that were locked down. You couldn't fly anywhere in China. And yet, if you wanted to go to Switzerland, you could just take that virus with you. And look, remember the testing kits that sent, were sent from China that were giving false readings and the masks and, that didn't work and the gowns that were contaminated with bacteria sent to U.S. hospitals to you, be used in operating rooms? They don't care. So I'm delighted to say on a positive note that because of the pandemic, people are waking up and looking at and talking about we need more resilient supply chains, but we need to act and not just talk. The, so you've made a lot of progress in the last year since we've, we've, we, we last talked. Uh, are they... I, hate that. I don't want to hear the answer. Are they involved in vaccine production? Uh, I tweeted about this not long ago, and I have not done independent analysis <laughs> on this. But according to one news report, that there is a Chinese company that's making some of the starting material used in at least one vaccine. Well, that's a that's a point that I did not quite appreciate. It's not like you take a drug and it's the drug. It's it's it's. It's made up of dozens and dozens of different subcomponents. It's like buying salsa in the supermarket. Like buying salsa. Tomato salsa, salsa. Yeah. okay. It has lots of ingredients in it. And some of those ingredients, um, say the hot peppers, might be sourced from one country and the tomatoes from another. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, actually get a lot of tomatoes from China. You're so, making me rethink my pasta. Well, okay. So what's the, <laughs> so what's the answer? The answer is... What do we buy, and let's use our purchasing power differently. What about labeling laws? What about drug manufacturers, your, your more robust labor, country of origin laws? What about something that would allow us to see what we're buying? Uh, they'll kill it in a heartbeat. But they being the generic drug manufacturers, is they, that, do they have a yes. trade association yes. which is showering uh, Capitol Hill with money? There is a generic trade association, and then there's the big pharma trade association. And they don't want people to, either of them want people to know where it's but coming from. But the big from. pharma makes the, 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 the brand drug, and then it comes off 
patent and then it's manufactured by the generic manufacturers. Did, well, how are their in interests aligned? I thought they were maybe separate. Even some of the big pharma innovator products contain components made in China. Okay. Remdesivir is okay. being talked about as a treatment for coronavirus and I was told by a very authoritative source that some of the components there are sourced in China. So just because it's on patent and it's branded doesn't necessarily mean that that's free from this risk that we face with the generics. Uh, it's uh, consistent in that there could be some components just like generics from China. I think it's also fair to say that the branded companies have much greater incentive to ensure that their product is a quality product. Now you, because they put their name on the box. Sure. Well, yeah, uh, yeah they've much. They have a, well, the big pharma's got a much bigger reputation risk. On the other hand, they've they're out there with all sorts of reputational rep, reputational issues anyway. Indeed. <laughs> but you know, on the labeling thing, what um, I'm trying to do now is to there's a number of domestic manufacturers here that see opportunity in, in a good sense to make quality generics here at home. And what I'd like to see is let's just use the marketplace and have these companies that are willing to put the country of origin well, this, on the box. This is, do where, it. this is where you say something that I think is quite smart. You talk about the number of companies and governments that they've been charged to buy things based on price. Price, 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 lowest cost. And you, 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 your point is you think they ought to be charged with buying things based on value which is not just price, but it's, it's where it's sourced, it's the quality. I mean, what are the aspects of value that uh, you think we ought to be including in, in our marching orders to buy stuff? Yeah, you're right. We have to buy it based on where it's sourced, the quality of and reputation of the company making it, and their transparency. You know, let me uh, share a very positive uh, story here, Bill. There's uh, about 1,400 hospitals led by the Mayo Clinic and other large health systems that got together. Mm -hmm. This is before the pandemic. And they said, we, are, we don't like all these drug shortages. It turns out because we are centralizing the market and China has undercut everybody, you have fewer and fewer manufacturers. So what happens? You're, you're going to have shortages. So we've had hundreds of drugs, life-saving drugs in shortage. So these hospitals got together and they formed a nonprofit called Civica Rx. And they ha are putting their money together to create a new supply chain with trustworthy manufacturers, full transparency on where it's made. Their uh, CEO testified before Congress and said, here's where our finished drugs are made and here's where the key ingredients are made. So that's a big entrepreneurial opportunity. It is. And this was before COVID they started. And within the first year, 20 different drugs were delivered to these hospitals. The next year, another 20. This was through contract manufacturing with trustworthy manufacturers inspected by the people of this group. And they have redundant capabilities so there won't be shortages. And within five years, they expect to make 100 different drugs. They just op uh, broke ground on a, a drug manufacturing facility in Virginia. Kaiser Permanente just joined them with their 10 plus million members. So people are using their procurement dollars differently to ensure quality medicines for their patients and an uninterrupted supply. And these hospitals did not have shortages of these drugs during the pandemic as others did. And they also paid less, because what happens when you have a shortage? Price goes up. Oh, sure. Well, what are, what are the price differentials? Let's, let's take something simple like, well, you, you pick the drug. Let's, let's, let's pick a drug that's manufactured in India and China, and let's make it here. What, how much would you need to pay? How much, how, much would, how much more would you need to pay to buy something made in the United States as opposed to there? You know, we're trying to. Uh, I'm oversimplifying. No, this, I no, this is this is a, the right question. Yeah, and we're at a point now where um, we can say that there the, there would be a marginal, likely marginal increase in the cost paid to the manufacturer, but how much would it be? 
It depends upon whether that product is in shortage or not, because when it's in shortage, the price goes up dramatically or you can't even get it. So there'd be at least, I think, at least a 10% plus premium. Well, that's nothing. I mean, I would, based on being scared to death by Rosemary Gibson exactly in the right. last 45 minutes, yeah, well, we should, I'd pay yeah. double. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, mean, and, um, I think a lot of people would. If you knew if you knew where it was made and you knew it was inspected by the FDA right. and you knew it was okay, right. you'd pay more. Of course you would, uh, especially if you knew that it was coming from a country that you don't trust. Let, and let yeah. me tell you a quick story. There's other actors here, not to make it more complicated, but so uh, a gentleman who works in the industry went to get his blood pressure medicine prescription refilled, 90-day supply, generic. It was $157.50. And he said to me, guess how much the manufacturer would be paid for that? So I'm going to get, how much would you guess? $157, I don't, um, if in our supply chain right now, I'd say manufacturer, what, got $15? I said 20 a dollar. Yeah, see, there you go. It all gets the, the, the dreaded middleman. That's exactly right. So <laughs> the other thing we have to do is bypass. Which are the which are distribution wholesalers and the hospitals. Exactly and, right. Okay. So we also need a different distribution channel. So if, we, if we, we could pay five times the cost to manufacture if we could get it through the distribution channel. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so we have to find a different way, a more economical way of getting product from the manufacturer to the user. Hmm. Now, Amazon is doing that. Amazon has started Amazon Pharmacy, and this is interesting, but... That scares me to death because Jeff I, Bezos. I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I was I was talking with a Washington. We need Post another reporter. entrepreneur besides Jeff Bezos. <laughs> I was talking with a Washington Post reporter who was kind of skeptical about this whole issue. Yeah. I don't know why, but I said, "Well, someday you'll thank me because at some point you'll be required as part of your health plan to use Amazon Pharmacy." And the way the FDA is going and its inability to protect the public, and China doesn't want them there anyway that those products will be coming someday, maybe in my lifetime, those drugs will be coming directly from China to your home in a nice package. That's what's going to happen. And when that happens, you'll remember this conversation. So we have to fix this, but... Okay, well, let's talk about fixing yeah. it. You, you also point out that nobody in the government knows where drugs are sourced and where it's manufactured. We don't have any... I mean, you've probably done as much work as anybody to try to figure this out. I mean, how many other people are there like you, and can we get together and throw some money in and, and figure out what right. the... We, we need, to, need to, First, we need right. to figure out what the problem is. Right. And we still don't really know, I mean, in detail. Here's how to start, because it's a big problem, and I think it's a very another positive step, Bill, <clears throat> is um, let's start with those basic drugs that are necessary for survival. And fortunately, the FDA, because of an executive order that came out last August, August 2020, in that executive order, the FDA was asked to come up with a list of what are the most essential generic drugs a country we need to have. And they came out with this list on October 30th. That's the place to start. How many drugs are on that list? They, they combine it with some medical supplies and devices. Okay. But there's probably maybe a couple hundred. Okay. A manageable amount. It is a manageable amount. And so let's start with that and map the supply chain for that. There is some work ongoing there by mm -hmm. different parties. It's not shared, however. You know what happened during right as the pandemic was ready to hit? The government didn't know where this stuff was coming from, these essential drugs. And there were good people that I put the leaders in our government in touch with from industry and academia. And they, they wrote out, this. here's the supply chain. Here are the drugs we need to take care of these patients who are hospitalized. Remember the surge? Here are the drugs. Here's where the active ingredients come from, and here's where the raw materials come from. The government didn't know. No reason they should know. So we have to formalize that process, and that was another recommendation in China RX. Just like we predict energy supplies in the future, we have modeling for that. With our food supply, we need to do the same thing with our essential medicines. 
So they're trying in fits and starts, but we need a much more entrepreneurial model and a more business-oriented model that would really uh, get down to the nitty-gritty and prepare this uh, model with predictive analytics. Well, you're not. See, I, I don't think you're recommending anywhere of sort of an industrial policy for uh, you. You're really trying to figure out market-based solutions to get to get get control of our, uh, our of our own drug supply. But well, you got to have the government agency, right. and you also mentioned we could have a DARPA-like uh, funding. DARPA has funded a lot of things for the Defense Department. We could have something similar yes. to seed uh, new ideas for. Uh, for pharmaceuticals. Actually, DARPA has done that, Bill. They <coughs> uh, invested in advanced manufacturing of essential drugs. Yeah. And there's uh, great people that have, are able to make an antibiotic in a box. They can make a thousand pills in 24 hours in a box the size of a refrigerator. Hmm. So how do we take that? And that was one of the recommendations I gave to Congress. Let's find a way to commercialize that technology and take it to commercial scale production. And the federal government actually did fund that uh, last May with a, a group in Virginia to make critical ingredients for essential generic drugs using advanced manufacturing technology. The result being end-to-end -end production of essential drugs fully made in the United States. And it's not just money to do research. They have a contract to actually produce product for the strategic national stockpile. Hmm. Well, I'm just I'm thinking in my in my private equity mode. It seems if you had if you had effective labeling, and one of your recommendations is that the manufacturers need to disclose um, whether their products and active ingredients, chemicals, etc., come from countries that are adversaries or strategic competitors the United States. So if you had to identify the countries that are the bad actors and you're not allowed to use them, then all of a sudden it levels the playing field for other people to come in because maybe they're sourcing that at a lower price there. I don't know. I mean, is that, is that part, of the, part of the solution? Uh, there's certainly interest among some members of Congress to do that. I still think it'll be hard to get a law like that passed. Yeah. So I'd like to use the other approach of good actors, good companies that have a um, public camp communications campaign that says, here's where our drugs are made. We're proud of that. And how about everybody else? How come you aren't telling us where your product is made? Good. I remember when, remember when Ralph Nader was out uh, kind doing Kind of a made his, in America. Yeah. He was out um, on car safety. And he was, you know, challenging the automakers about unsafe vehicles. And what happened? Chrysler said, well, we're going to turn this around and make it a competitive advantage. And we're going to make safety and build it into our cars. Mm -hmm. And look what happened. So let's use this um, consumer interest in safety as a competitive advantage in the marketplace. That said, short of industrial policy, I think it makes sense for... Department of Defense, why are they buying drugs made in China? Why is the VA? So what if we yeah, had our taxpayer dollars go to companies making them here in this country? Particularly since we're likely to be in a hot war over Taiwan sometime. Well, the South China Sea issues affect supply. Yeah. Look what happened. We had one freighter that got stuck on the Suez Canal. Look what that did. And fast forward, perhaps not too long from now, what's going to happen to the South China Sea and trade routes? Well, they've got their, that's definitely in their next step category. You know, they've, they've, they've taken Hong Kong back. And I don't think, I just am waking up to the fact that most of our semiconductors come from Taiwan. And a lot of the right. pharmaceuticals that are manufactured that are so-called outside of China are, are manufactured in, in Taiwan. Right. Um, so, and so you've got supply routes at risk, prices going up already. The Wall Street Journal is reporting on inflationary pressures on prices coming out of China. And you have quality concerns. So I think people are waking up to it. And we just have to move quickly and bring manufacturing back home and change how we buy.
And I'm happy to say that there's more and more people now taking this, taking a very close look at this, because it's, this is life and death. And I say to companies, look, you won't have anything to sell if you don't move production and diversify your manufacturing base. I think they're getting that message. But some of them are still stuck because they still have operations in China. Yeah. They are stuck. So good progress to report, but we got to keep going and move quickly. Well, Rosemary, I'll, we'll, we'll have you back soon to talk some more because we've just touched the tip of the iceberg on this one. And what a service this book is, China Rx. And I think it's, it's, it's timely and, and we all need to be, uh, be acting on its recommendations. And it sounds like you're making a lot of progress. So congratulations uh, so far. Oh, well, Bill, I'm grateful to you for giving this an airing because this affects all of us. And I, I don't mean to frighten people, but... Well, you frighten me. Um, my aim is to enlighten, <laughs> not frighten. No, I, actually not frighten. But I do. But we have come up with some lines of action. We're not just going to sit here and... Absolutely. Yeah. And we need good investors who want to invest for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Again, these are commodity products, and you're not going to make a killing on it. We can find some good patriotic people who want to do a great service to this country. This is where we need investment, and it will pay off in so many different ways. Well, maybe our next show ought to be with a private equity person, and we can get into how we could turn this into a money-making industry. I would welcome that. It would be interesting. Let's do it. Yeah, let's play around with that. I look forward to it. Okay. Thank Rosemary you so Gibson, thank you. This is great. Back soon. Back soon. And China RX, we, I want people to know no one paid me to do this work. I did it because I care. And we donate proceeds to good causes. So I hope people will take a look at China RX. Great. I do too. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh, let's follow Rosemary's advice and pay attention to uh, China RX. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.